Um, welcome everybody. I'm excited to see everybody here and I'm excited to have Chris join us today to talk about some interesting ways to uh, ramp up your resources for some projects you might have on the go. Um, a little bit about me and how I got involved with TechSoup. Um, I've been involved in IT. One second, I've got some background noise going on. Can you guys be quiet, please? The joy of having a uh, kids at home and everyone in a small condo. Sorry, guys. Um, so I've been involved in IT for over 20 years, um, and I've been implementing operational systems for everything from nonprofits to small businesses to large organizations and government entities as well. Um, I'm Google Cloud cer certified, so I've been focusing lately on helping nonprofits get on Google for nonprofits as well as Google uh, Google's G Suite for nonprofits. Um, and I, I know Eli presented a great little package there, and um, the, the one thing uh, kind of missing from there is the fact that Google for Nonprofits is actually free, uh, which is a great resource for um, all the nonprofits who need to work uh, more efficiently together. And um, I've been passionate about helping small businesses and nonprofits uh, work more efficiently and implement better systems. Uh, because I'm also the president of a nonprofit. So I am the president for the One Parent Families Association of Canada. Um, and I've been doing that for about a year, but I've had a meetup group for that that's ran longer. And kind of my love for nonprofits and my love for technology uh, led me to find uh, NetSquared here. And I saw they were looking for a Toronto organizer. So I stepped up and I'm really excited to be here with everybody. And uh, like Eli said, please reach out to me. If you have any suggestions or want to become involved or want to present anything, would love to hear from you guys. So I am going to stop talking now so we can pass this on to Chris, who's got a great presentation for you guys. And um, if you have any questions throughout, just pop it in the chat and I'll uh, interrupt him and see if we can get that answered. Great. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sandra. And Eli, thank you for that uh, great introduction. Awesome to see all the amazing packages you could give to uh, nonprofits, help them save money, make things more efficient. Um, I'm gonna get started by sharing my screen right away. Um, there we go. Super excited today to talk to everyone about modernizing your workforce. So there's some amazing platforms that exist like Upwork, Top Talent, Fiverr, that you could really leverage to be more productive both with your work or even personally and actually save money. So really excited for this chat today and hope everyone can get a lot out of it. I wanna start things off with a quote. There are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. I felt like this really encapsulates the last 12 months well, where a lot of organizations had maybe a 10 year plan to modernize their workforce, to integrate new technologies, but all of a sudden COVID-19 happens. And the next 10 years were consolidated into what, a few weeks, a few months. And you had to rapidly change the way your business operated, the way your nonprofit operated to become more modern, but also decentralized. Everyone's working from home. So there's a lot of implications of this and adapting to it is key. And a lot of businesses have. So right now, 53% of companies and nonprofits have moved to more flexible talent. And what does that actually look like? So in America, uh, the number of freelancers that existed, well, from 2015 to 2020, uh, 2020, 2020 uh, there has been a 20% increase in freelancers, and that's expected to go up to 80 million by 2025. This is a substantial amount of the workforce. And of the, these freelancers, a lot of them tend to be a bit younger. So in my age group, the 25 to 34s, we're looking for more flexibility on where and when to work or choosing which projects to want to work on on having direct bosses and more flexibility. So this isn't a temporary thing. This is a, a complete shift into how businesses operate into who they hire and how they hire them. So having the knowledge and the experience to understand how to leverage the, this workforce will be critical. Before we dive into anything, I want to give a quick intro about who I am. So my name is Chris, I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'm a graduate from a top business school here, a three-time founder. I had one successful exit and one's actually current on, on a million dollar revenue pace per year, which is great. I've consulted for over 30 businesses across 15 different industries from nonprofits to real estate, to private equity, media, 
uh, food and beverage, fashion. I've seen a lot of different industries, which allows me to really distill business principles to its core fundamentals. I understand how to apply it to amongst any industry. And finally, I'm a Canadian delegate for the United Nations. Most recently, I well, prior to COVID, you were able to travel. Uh, most recently, I was in Madrid to represent the, non, the, the private sector for Canada at uh, the COP25, which is the climate change conference. So today we're gonna to look for three key things. One, outsourcing, what it actually is it? How do you figure out what tasks to outsource? Then it's finding talent, and then finally managing that talent. All three of these are critical. So first, outsourcing 101. So why should you outsource? How could you decide which role should be outsourced? And how can you outsource some of your own tasks? So going from both business and even personally outside of business. So this is a quote from a high level executive from a company called Ranger Labs. It's a technology company. They deal with more business technologies. But the quote says, our success is very much tied to how we use freelancers every day. The cost of sa savings are great, but the real value is getting a distributed ex expertise. I got so many more brains working on a problem that I could never get hiring employees. So two things, one, the cost savings, but two, the distributed expertise. I actually recently worked with a client who was headquartered in Singapore. The CEO was in the Ukraine. Um, their C chief technology officer was in South Africa. The head of product was in the United States. Designer was in Italy. They had a workforce across the entire world. And the reason being is because he was just looking for the best talent. So now people who are were previously just competing within your own city now compete globally. So you could find the best talent for the within your price range, and making it much more competitive for freelancers, but much more effective for businesses and nonprofits to hire. So how do you decide which roles to outsource? This is a key question. To use this, I'm gonna first walk through an example. Let's say you have a project and you have a budget allocated towards it. Let's say it's a $50,000 budget for the year. And it's a fundraising event. You have to throw this event to raise money for your nonprofit. Well, if we were to break that down, let's say there's probably more components, but just high level, there's money going to people, there's money going to events, there's money going to marketing, and then money going to admin. Break that down even further, and people, you have some event coordinators, you have customer service, sales. The event, you have the venue, you have food and beverage, auction gifts, if it's not donated. For the marketing, you have online, offline, to measure and report everything to making sure you're reaching your fundraising goals. And then admin, you have accounts receivable and payable, their software, et cetera. You have all these expenses and moving pieces within one thing called a project that you have to budget for. But the thing is, within each of these, you have a lot of opportunity to outsource. And by outsourcing, I don't mean completely replace a role. I mean, well, that is one option, but a second option is to complement a role to make your current employees and team members more efficient and effective. So let's take an example of marketing. So marketing, we have online and offline. Within online marketing, let's say we have Instagram, Google ads, Facebook ads, webinars, press, all these different opportunities. There's more, let's stick with that. All of a sudden you have the opportunity to out find talent to help manage your Instagram, your Google ads, your Facebook ads. All this talent is easy to find and commoditize. You could get a really good price for high quality. And you could do something as big as high uh, outsource for a marketing manager to manage all the online, manage the online and the offline, or just find a specialist who knows Instagram really well. So let's say we do that. Let's say we find a specialist who knows Instagram really well. Well, Instagram has all these tasks. You have to design posts, you have to write captions, you have to organize and schedule posts, engage with followers, measurement and reporting. This is a lot to do for one person. So by hiring extra talent, you don't have to hire a full-time employee and all the costs that come with that. You could hire a specialist on a platform like Upwork, which we'll get into later, who could really complement your team to help you, allow you to focus on the tasks that are move the needle much more, but delegate the things that are still necessary to do. And in terms of thinking about costs, you're saying, Chris, how am I going to save money? Because I thought I'm paying an additional employee. Well, let's say you earn $50 an hour, if it were to break it down hourly, and you hire a freelancer that's worth $20 an hour, hypothetically. One, you may think, oh, I'm spending $20 an hour. But the better way to think about it is actually you're saving $30 an hour. The reason being is now that hour that you had to do, let's say, managing that Instagram page, you could reallocate and focus more on tasks that are driving, uh, drive progress within your nonprofit or within your personal life. Things that are, that are worth $50 an hour and not tasks that are worth 20. So by spending 20, you get to refocus on 
things that push that will progress you forward and in doing so become more productive and more effective. So now let's go into how you could outsource some of your own tasks. So either within your company or yourself. And here there's a framework to use. It's a well-known framework, but I really want to drive it home because of how powerful it actually is. It's called the Eisenhower matrix. Some of you may have already heard of it, but it's good walking through. The, the matrix has two axes, so important and non-important. And how you define important is up to you. So for example, in my business, I actually define it based on if it's a, it could be potentially a revenue driver for one of my businesses or if it's not. And then urgent and not urgent. Does it have to be done today or the next week? Is, there, is it time sensitive or not? And with each of these axes, there's a certain quadrant. And in that quadrant, it defines tasks differently. So first you have the important and urgent tasks. So this is what you actually have to focus on, what you have to do. They, they're both add a lot of value to your business and your nonprofit, and they're time sensitive. So for example, let's say you run your nonprofit and you have this fundraising event and you have a sales pitch next week to a large potential donor. That's very important and it's very urgent. That task would go here and you have to do it. And there's many tasks like this. But the next quadrant is, is where a lot of the magic actually happens, the non-urgent and important tasks. Here you have to decide and do, so schedule it in. The reason why this is a, like where a lot of the magic happens in terms of growth for your nonprofit, in terms of growth for your impact and your, or your business, is because these are the things no one's watching over you to do. No one's forcing you to, let's say, for example, find or create a new fundraising strategy to have a stronger nonprofit. You could always do the same, but to grow your impact, these are the tasks you have to do. They're more long-term tasks, not urgent, but very important to do. And these you have to schedule and really prioritize within your day. The third quadrant is the not urgent and not important. These tasks you delete. So let's say it's as simple as scrolling through your social media page throughout the day. You shouldn't be doing that because it distracts from other time and it doesn't increase. It has no importance to your business and no urgency. You could always book a specific time to do more relaxing things like watch Netflix or Instagram. This is just an example, but it shouldn't be part of your day-to-day -day work. And finally, which is part of the topic of conversation is delegate. It's not important, but it's urgent. These are the tasks you give, give out to freelancers to, to work on. So they're time sensitive. They don't accomplish any big goals specifically. So for example, I know it's bad timing, but travel booking, scheduling social content, Amazon purchases, uh, replying to every email. Not every email is important for you to reply to. Data entry. There's so many potential tasks you could outsource. And these, this goes in the delegate quadrant. So how do you actually use this? What you do is you take this quadrant and you take every single task you have to do within your week. Let's say it's meetings or um, work tasks or personal tasks. And you have to put it in one of these four boxes. And you start to realize how much how much stuff you were doing that wasn't actually important. Because if everything's a priority, nothing is. The first time I actually implemented this matrix in my own life, I completely ignored anything below that urgent line. And just to see what, what my work life would be like just by focusing on the tasks that are truly important. And I've never had a more productive week in my life. So by delegating and deleting, you individually become more productive and more effective as an employee, as an individual too. Maybe it's in your loved ones or your, yourself in health and wellness or your business and nonprofit. Now, before we get into this, the, the finding, that was outsourcing one-on-one. -on -one. Before we get into finding talents, uh, is there any specific questions we could look into? Otherwise we can leave it for the end. It's not a problem. I can't see the comments, unfortunately. I don't uh, see any questions that have come in yet. So I think you're good to keep going. Great. If there is any, just pause and let me know. But Will do. We could always save it for the end if you, uh, if you have one. Sure. But yeah, so high level, now that we know how, what to outsource, so you, have your, you figure out within your organization what should be outsourced, why it's important to outsource, it's not a cost, it's an actual saving. And then two, how to prioritize your own tasks to outsource some of your own work. But secondly, now it's how do you actually find this talent? Once you know what to outsource, how do you find people to do the work? Here, we're gonna go through the overview of Upwork, Fiverr, and TopTel, some great platforms. We're gonna use Upwork as an example on how to hire a freelancer, just to keep it focused, and some tips and tricks to find the perfect freelancer. So I have a lot of experience hiring freelancers with the, on these platforms, so I'm excited to share a lot of this with you. So the three platforms, we have Fiverr, Upwork, and TopTel. And the reason I chose these three, because there's much more, 
Um, like in, in uh, Australia, there's freelancer.com, which is a very big one. But these are the three I want to focus on because they target different types of work. So the things I want to look over is the unique selling proposition, the approval process for the freelancers, who are you actually hiring, the number of job categories and the deal project type. So first is Fiverr, they're very large and their unique selling prop is job starting at $5. When it comes to the freelancers that they bring on, it's quite lenient. You just got to have proof of identity. So a driver's license and email confirmation is pretty simple, but they have a vast range of job categories from logo creation, graphic design, maybe business plans, et cetera. But because they have a, they're very lean in the approval process, the talent pool tends to be a bit weaker or skew towards the top and those who have a large volume of work. So it's meant for more short-term entry-level projects. The second is Upwork, and this is actually my favorite platform. Uh, and on Upwork, you could hire the perfect freelancer for all project types. So as we see later in the job description, you could choose between entry-level work, uh, intermediate work, or expert-level uh, freelancers based on your budget and based on your job description. The filtering is actually quite strict. So to actually get on as a freelancer, you go through a filtering process. And if your skill set is in high supply, then you probably won't actually get a profile because they don't need you as an add-on. And if your portfolio is weak, they still, they'll still filter you out. They do have a vast range of job categories. You could get anything on here. So I've actually done data work with freelancers here. I've hired a virtual assistant. I've hired uh, developers, uh, graphic designers. You can really find someone for anything. And it's meant for all project scopes. So what I like about Upwork is it's flexibility based on what you actually need. The final is TopTal. Now TopTal is really meant for, like they're, at the beginning they were geared more towards technology companies, but they're starting to expand out, out, outside of that. And their key value proposition is they hire the top 3% of freelancers. So they have an extremely strict filtering process that starts with a test to make sure you actually have like, adequate knowledge on the topic. And they filter you through various interviews and case studies uh, until they only get the top 3% of talent pool that, that actually applies. They have a much stricter job category. So it's more like project management, product management, development, et cetera. And it's meant for mid to long-term expert level contracts. So the, the reason I want to bring all three of these up is there's a platform for whatever need you potentially could have. Fiverr being those low entry level ones, TopTal being those complex team-based projects. So you could hire an entire team on, on TopTal. And they have Upwork, which is very, very flexible. You could hire freelancers or agencies on it. Uh, and it has a lot of power to it. So let's go through an example. Just focusing on one to keep it simple. We're gonna use Upwork to source and hire talent. So there's four steps. So identify your need, create your job posting, filter and invite talent and hire. So let's go to identify your need, taking that example from uh, in the beginning of my presentation. So let's say you're a marketing manager who needs assistance with Instagram and you're executing on post planning, design and scheduling. Your budget for this is around $20 an hour. Great. Now that you know what you need to get done, then you could have a better understanding of what your job posting should entail to then find the perfect person for that job. So when you're creating your job posting on Upwork, you have to you know, write your, get, to get started. It's a short-term or long-term project. You have your title, description, details, the experience level I was talking about, the visibility. So you can actually make it private to only those you invite. You can make it available to anyone on Upwork. Uh, the budget for the project, that's based on hourly, based on project. So you can actually choose what your budget is and then you publish it. And there's a lot of key uh, tips and tricks I wanna walk through uh, later on how to actually write a really, really good job description. Once you have it posted, you have to filter and invite talent. So there's, um, if, if it's difficult to see, I'll explain what you're looking at. So you have a filter button and you can filter based on amount earned. So that's basically a derivative of experience level on Upwork the job success score, hourly rates, uh, talent types or agencies or freelancers, uh, ex English level, because it is an international platform. Uh, how necessary is it for them to be fluent in English uh, and the category. So once you have it filtered, you then search and you can invite talent. So here's a list of all potential talents I could have invited to the job based on my job description and based on my filters. And then once you find your talent, you go through an interview process and you hire them. You click, all you have to do is click hire talent, you decide and you finalize if it's an hourly rate, what the hourly rate is, what the weekly limit is uh, in terms of earnings for them. So you can manage your budget, the work description, you click hire and then you can manage the talent. So it's really simple and straightforward and intuitive. Now top talent, I just want to bring this up because not all platforms are like this. 
they actually handhold you because they are more focused on bigger projects, more expensive projects. Here, you actually talk to one of their experts. They figure out what you need for you. And they, they work with you to hand select talent. It says an average of 24 hours to do so. And they have a perfect fit for you. So you have an intermediary finding the talent for you. One leads to less, less choice, which is actually a good thing because you, you know what you're getting is quality. And two, it actually increases the likelihood of success on the project because you have someone filtering. So different platforms have different processes, but uh, Upwork seems to be the, the one common in, uh, amongst other platforms. So tips and tricks on this. Uh, this is key because I've done a lot of hiring on Upwork uh, for my own businesses. And the key I found is knowing how to write a uh, post and, and following these tricks to find the best talent. So the first one is writing a detailed job posting. First off, Upwork has an algorithm on who your talent, who the best fit talent is, and that's based on a lot of the keywords in your job description. So ensuring that you're writing a job description that's detail oriented is key. But also secondly, higher quality freelancers respect job postings that have more detail in them because they're putting more time into it and it feels like this, the process is more serious. So writing a detailed job posting is great. You'll, you'll be surprised at how many job postings are just very general uh, and simple and it's, it causes less talent to wanna to apply. Number two, it's a creative test for each step in the hiring process. So the steps let's, like, like we went to before is first writing your job posting. I would usually always put a, a, a sentence like, if you're reading this, write the word banana in your cover letter, something random like that to show that they actually read through it in detail. And then once they apply to the job and they pass that test, then I give them tests based on the job I was hiring for. So for example, uh, at one time I was hiring for a data entry job and the first job posting was to see if they, how well they could do managing Excel files. Once they passed that filter, I had a second task, which was finding leads for me in Canada. And it was a very small one, let's say it's 10 leads. And based on the quality of that, I had a final inter video interview with the remaining candidates. This allowed me to filter talent and not waste my time video interviewing everyone. Because I had a step in each stage in the process that filtered people out. Third is to start with a small project and then scale responsibilities. So every time I hire someone, I'd always start hourly, see how they work with me, see the quality of their work. And then once I, they gain my trust, then we work into larger projects and I integrate them more into my day-to-day -to, -day, um, to allow me to outsource uh, roles within my organization or specific tasks that I have. And finally, is to standardize the process. These are tips and tricks I'm sharing with you, but I have a certain process that I have with myself that. I, Every time, this is what I have in a job posting. These are the things I want to list. When I'm searching for talent, this is how I search. This way it's scalable. And I could, as my businesses or the nonprofit scale, you could also give this sort of playbook to other employees to leverage. So that's finding talent. It's quite simple on a lot of these platforms. They make it easy for you to do, but there are ways to do it on a more expert level to make sure you find the best talent. And now once you have that talent, the final step is managing it. So let's dive into that. Once hired, how do you manage a freelancer and how do you keep track of outsourced talent? So how do you manage freelancers on these platforms? Well, there's a tab called My Hires on Upwork. And here, this is a list of actual hired people that I've hired in the past. And you can see a list of every single person you've hired before. So let's say I had a similar job that I, I, I really liked the freelancer who worked on it. I could click rehire, give them the job posting and it's super simple to actually interact with them. In addition, you could also leverage else, uh, outside technology. We're talking about G Suite, there's Excel and there's also a platform that's called Airtable that I really love. Um, and there you just, you could do it on any one of these platforms. You have a list of all your freelancers. You see what department they're in. Uh, that way you could see, all right, I need a developer. And you can see a list of all the developers you have, or I need a accountant, a list of all the accountants you've worked with in the past or bookkeeper, sorry. And, and with that, you could choose your talent accordingly. That's another way to do it. Second is milestone management. So I covered some of the, price, the, the, the dollar amounts here, but this is a freelancer I actually worked with uh, and I'm currently working with. And here I can see exactly what the budget is, how much has been, been paid, what the tasks are and what she has to still do. And I could see, I can see the progress of the project. And then within this same area, there's also messages and files. So I can attach all files that are, that are necessary for this project. So here she's actually just redesigning my logo. Uh, and I have a logo design brief that I attached. We, we message here. So I don't have to actually leave Upwork as a platform. And they have a great mobile app. So that's where I do all my messaging on it. And that's it. So we went through today outsourcing 101. 
Uh, we looked at finding talent, how to leverage these platforms to do so, and then managing talent. Once you've hired them, how do you actually manage them and control them on these platforms? And it all could be done on, for example, Upwork. It's all done within the platform and you could leverage outside platforms to, to enable this. Thank you for listening. Uh, I don't wanna give anyone Zoom fatigue because I know these presentations could be overwhelming if it's longer than 20 minutes. So I'll leave it there, open it up to any questions. Uh, if, uh, and if you have, or any problems you're facing, we could spend the last uh, few minutes discussing. Oh, there we go. Spend the last few minutes discussing any problems you may have. Thank you. Excellent, that was great, Chris. And a, a fun fact, I actually met Chris through Upwork because yeah. I was looking for um, some help and uh, that's how we came to know each other. So uh, it was, it's a great tool. <laughs> um, and I was really excited that you mentioned Airtable and somebody else, uh, Eli is mentioning Airtable as well. Um, I, I've, I've, been, I've checked it out a little bit, but uh, if ever you wanna do another presentation on Airtable for us, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, happy to, happy to. Yeah, no, that'd be super fun. <laughs> yeah, it looks really neat. It looks really powerful too. I just, I haven't had too much time to play with it, but. Yeah, Airtable is great. Um, it's a more of a visual, it's, it's not as powerful Excel, as Excel in terms of numbers and managing financials, but it's really powerful if you're trying to manage, manage projects. And if you used to use Excel for that, Airtable is a great replacement because they have cell options that allow for images or URLs or attachments, and it all can be really, really organized. And the filtering is really, really strong, really powerful. Um, so I like to do what managing, for example, people. Like I do manage my freelancers through your table because, because it allows me to organize by department and connect to other ELT or, or, or table platforms. So it's a, it's a great platform for sure. Excellent. Hi there. So this is Eli. Um, so I've got a question, which is, so I've often, yes, yeah, struggled around the job description part. Um, and an idea I've been thinking about, but I haven't really started doing yet is, do you sometimes maybe document out some workflows or like with a quick screen capture and make a quick video or how are you basically documenting out the required workflow so someone who's in a different time zone, maybe English isn't their first language is able to sort of follow through your expectations? That's a great question. Um, and it's very contextual. So let, let's take that example, let's take an example, let's say you have a blog and you want blog posts to be posted. That's a specific process. There's no creative thinking in there. What you can do, I use, some, there's some great platforms and I could type them in the chat. There we go. There's Loom and Vidyard. Vidyard is actually a Canadian company. Loom's an American one. Phenomenal screen recording apps. So all I do is record my process and then I write out the process. Uh, if it's something that I want to standardize and I don't want opinions or creative thinking on. Because of that, I don't need someone who's fluent in English. I don't need someone who's in my time zone. I could send them the project uh, and they could just get it done with the same process, right? But now let's say you're hiring someone that it necessitates more thinking, more delivery, maybe it's strategy work, maybe it's marketing work, whatever it is. Well, all of a sudden now your job description changes, your filtering changes. Maybe it is, a, let's say you're hiring a virtual assistant. Well, you're gonna need someone every day to, to chat with it makes sense for them to be in North America or with, close within your time zone. Um, if you're hiring someone that's a marketing manager, uh, copywriting is a big part of that. Now it's a necessity to hire someone who's fluent in English or time zone is still not a factor. So just think through the job you're outsourcing. And then within that job, you could figure out, okay, what do I need within these filters? Do they have to be within my country, within my time zone? Do they have to be fluent in English? Um, or uh, and do they need me to handhold them within the process? So it's really contextual. Cool, yeah, thank you. I think that's right. There are different kinds of work styles. Um, yeah, and to this point, I've only done the, here's a very set process thing because it's easy for me just to offload that and say like, here it is, I need it done many times over. Um, bringing someone in to be a more full partner and really like, get what you're trying to work with. I think is I struggled with that. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm like I'm optimistic to hear that you've had luck finding partners for that kind of work. Yeah, so uh, I've actually, for a person, I've hired a virtual assistant, uh, which seems like a lower entry level role, but whoever had one, has one knows how important it is that they could really execute well, because a lot of times they're writing emails for me uh, if I don't deem it necessary. And, uh, and within that, they got to really, have strong writing skills, have good thinking skills. So what I do there is I give them easy tasks to start with and then I scale up from there as they continue to gain my trust. 
Um, so I ensure that the tasks in the beginning are more like repeatable, systematic, like you mentioned. And then I say, okay, I could trust them there. Let's give them a bit more and then give them an inch of time as opposed to just give them everything. But then again, totally. Sandra mentioned that she met me on Upwork. That was actually for a large marketing project. Uh, and there she would have to give a lot of trust to me as a potential marketer because uh, she couldn't, if you, she, she was handholding me, she's not, she's wasting a lot of money uh, on, because I, I would charge a bit higher. She would waste a lot of money handholding me. She would just have to trust. So within that, then you use other tips and tricks, which is better filtering, give them some tests, have the final interview at the end and to test her personality. Um, so really, once again, it's contextual, but there's ways to do it where you could gain trust from, from people outside of your organization. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. So if there's any more questions, Matthew, Linda, Alex, Lori, happy to answer. Um, yep, I mean, think I'm through the chat. Linda do we have any volunteer really managers helpful. in the room? Because, you know, this this graduated level of, of, of scaling up responsibilities, you know, rings a lot of bells to me, given the work that I've done, which is always to say like, bring someone in for something that is safe and not time bound. Like, you know, if it goes wrong, it's okay. Um, and as those people step up and prove they, they get you, then you give them more and more work until eventually you say like, here, take my job, I'm retiring. <laughs> I, I know I did try to hire um, some admin staff through, I think it was through Upwork as well. And uh, I tried, I tried that approach. I tried doing little pieces or, you know, jump before you run or walk before you run. Um, and uh, it was a good thing I did because it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, and so, in, uh, Eli and Sandra and everyone else, that, that Eisenhower matrix I, I, I displayed, if you, if you haven't used it, like I, I, sp I spent 90 minutes organizing every task for the next month, putting it somewhere on this graph, use a big whiteboard. And then I realized how much stuff I was doing that I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, and to repeat it again, anything within delete or delegate, I just ignored for five days. It's, it's, it's not going to ruin anything with my work. I said, I'm just going to ignore it and see what happens instead of hiring someone to do it the short term. And like I mentioned, most productive week of my life because I was able to really focus on what mattered and figure out what is a priority instead of just doing busy work to confusing progress with motion, as I say. Um, so once you could figure out what to delegate, it'd be easier to figure out, all right, now I know who to, I, who's the first hire that I need to take a lot of these tasks off my plate. Absolutely. I, th I think there's a quote I read, never mistake motion for action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's another version of it for sure. Um, uh, we have a question here from Lori. Uh, what about privacy and security issues with data entry? How can this be ensured? Or I guess what she means is how can you trust somebody to do sensitive data entry for you when you don't know them. Yeah, so uh, let, let's say you're working with something like, it's a great question because it, it could be very valuable information. If it's something like in the past when I've worked with data entry people, I tend to, whenever I work with freelancers, I tend to work with shared sheets like Google Sheets, for example. The reason being is you could really manage access to that information. So in the beginning, what I always do is create a separate sheet that replicates what they would be seeing, but removes a lot of that private information. Well, um, and then once I could gain their trust and their talent, then I usually have them sign a privacy agreement or NDA. Sometimes it's not legally binding, but it usually has them mentally knowing they can't take any information. And then from there, I give them more access uh, to the sheets. But at any point I, I want, I can revoke their access immediately. Um, there's also ways within Google Sheets where you could have privacy settings on what people can or can't edit, can and can copy. There's a lot of things you could do within Sheets to help manage privacy for freelancers, uh, which is a big reason why I work with, work in it when working with uh, others. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Upwork has some sort of feature that it's got a screen recording, I think. So when the, the, the person's logged in, it's recording their screen doing the work for the period they're billing you for, I think. Yeah, so that's for hourly work only and it's okay. optional, right? So it's a great point bringing up Sandra. So let's say you want data entry work and you're paying hourly. You could require your freelancer on Upwork to use the Upwork feature. And it, like Sandra said, it literally takes a screen capture every 10 minutes to see, to, to show that they're actually working on the project they are. So they're building appropriately. Um, but that's also optional. Like I've worked with clients and I, I, I trusted them with the hourly wage they, they built them for. And I mean, anything can happen within those 10 minutes too, right? Anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
but uh, yeah, it's Lori, it's always a concern, um, but that's why you inch your way into trusting anyone, um, just like you would an employee. I, I liked your suggestion there, especially if it's a Google Sheet, um, uh, lock down like certain cells and stuff so that they can only edit those cells you want them to edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I had the one data entry person look at all of our revenue, they did access to all of our revenue numbers, cash numbers, everything from one of my businesses, um, which is sensitive information, but I locked all those cells and only unlocked the one column I had him work in every month. Um, so he had specific access. Excellent. Any other questions? No. A question to Eli and Sandy, will everyone have the presentation deck afterwards? Is that a possibility? Um, if anyone does want the presentation deck, they can email us or you can either email Chris directly or myself and we can send it to you. Um, we don't by default have everyone's email addresses here. No, but what I can do, uh, Chris, is if you send Sandra or me the slide deck, I will embed it into the blog post with the video and then we'll send that link to all the members of the meetup. And so we'll be able to make sure that people have access to that. Great, I'll definitely do that. Excellent. Yeah, because uh, a lot of these things sometimes can only be internalized when you look over it again or actually try it. Uh, my suggestion to everyone, if you're willing to try it, go on Upwork, hire someone for something super small. Um, even if it's a task you don't need, like design me a logo, uh, just to see that the process is like, you spend $50 doing it because uh, you can't get it for that cheap. Um, and just you spend fifty dollars learning, saying, "Oh, now I could get what I could actually use this for." You start trusting people a little bit more and understanding I can actually outsource a lot of the things I was doing. And to always keep in mind, you're not spending money; you're saving money because your your time is worth more than what you're paying. That's true. Excellent. All right, I guess that that wraps it up. I don't see any other questions coming in. So thank you, Chris, again, for everything. That was amazing. Thank you. And uh, I, I dropped Chris's uh, email and contact information in the chat um, earlier, as well as mine, um, if anyone wants to reach out. And uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or want to get involved. Um, happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn as well. Uh, and I'm, I assume, uh, not to speak to, for you, but I assume uh, Chris is Happy to connect with you as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Happy to connect with anyone, ask any questions. I'm, I'm here to support the community, as Eli said, and uh, anyone who is looking to progress individually or within the orgs. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Amazing. All right, Eli. Thank you. Lovely. Right. Thank you so much, y'all. All right. Have a great day. Bye.